Welcome to the basketball party. I'm Sam Ekstrom of Locked On Sports Minnesota. The best in the West takes on the best in the East tonight in the NBA. We're talking about that on today's Minnesota Basketball Party. This is Locked On Sports Minnesota podcast. It's endless Minnesota Timberwolves talk with the diverse voices of your local experts. It's time for the Minnesota Basketball Party on the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Welcome in, everyone. It's Wolves Talk every Wednesday here on Locked On Sports Minnesota. I'm Sam Ekstrom. You'll meet the rest of the crew in a second. We are streaming on Locked On Sports Minnesota's YouTube channel and the 24 7 live stream. I mean, hopefully, you find us there. Hopefully, you listen to us as well in the Locked On Wolves audio feed wherever you get your podcasts. Amazon Fire, Roku, Sirius XM, alternate ways to watch and or listen to us. So many ways to consume Locked On Sports Minnesota. Thanks to our everydayers who tune in all the time. Let's meet the crew. I'm Sam Ekstrom. We've got our opening tip. Let's go around the circle. Well, I'm Ron Johnson, former Gophers wide receiver and NFL wide receiver. But I want to talk about the Minnesota Timberwolves. Anthony Edwards, a no-show but the Timberwolves still pull it off. I'm Reggie Wilson from CARE 11, and uh, I also want to talk a little bit about Ant. No show, but I don't think for long. We got the second of a back-to-back. I'm Ben Beacon, host of the Locked On Wolves daily podcast, and I'm going to talk today about how I actually feel better about the Wolves after uh, this this stretch where they've arguably struggled, but against really good competition. I feel better now about the Wolves than I did a month ago. I'm Jack Borman, editor-in-chief at Candace Hoopus, and instead of talking about my Michigan Wolverines winning the national title, <laughs> I'm going to talk a little bit to you guys about why the blueprint is there for, for Carl Anthony Towns' success for the rest of the season. If you start talking Wolverines, you're going to get Tony reality I'm going to mute you like around the horn, so don't even try it. I've got the power. I can do that. Uh, today's show is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more right now. New customers get $150 in bonus bets with a $5 bet. That's $150 if you bet five. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. So much to get to today. The Wolves route the magic. Celtics coming up tonight. They've got one game left in their schedule gauntlet before it eases up. How do we feel about the Wolves after seeing them against playoff teams for the last month? Trade deadline's a month away. What are we thinking about that about four weeks out? And Ricky Rubio retires. What is his legacy? So much to get to on today's show. But let's start with last night and Ron Johnson saying Anthony Edwards, the no-show, some foul trouble. He just wanted to stay fresh, Ron. He wanted to stay fresh for the Celtics game tonight, but it didn't matter. The Wolves led by 30 at halftime against the Magic, and they win handily, uh, cruising to the finish line. Big win for Minnesota last night, Ron. Yeah, I mean, that's the big thing. When you look at getting out early on teams, uh, putting your foot on their throat and keeping them down. You know, Anthony Edwards wasn't needed. Now, I kind of joked around, no show, but here's the thing. We've seen Carl Anthony Towns not show up. We've seen Rudy Gobert not show up. And every time somebody stepped up, and this was another great sign of a, of a great team. I think Reggie is probably going to hit on this a little bit. But this is this is the key. Like, he deserves every once in a while to have somebody else carry the load. If he has to go 35 and 10 every single night, they're not going to be able to be sustainable down the stretch because playoff teams, as you alluded to, Sam, they're going to eventually say, you know what? Let's Steph, let Steph Curry, let's treat him like Steph Curry. When he gets the ball, let's get the ball out of his hand and let somebody else beat him. And what last night, what they put on film, the big thing was, yeah, if he is off, if he is in foul trouble, if he's not playing as much, we still got Jade McDaniels. We still got Carl Anthony Towns. Rudy Gobert can give us points if needed. If we need to go to him. Because I love that Rudy Gobert is playing his role because I think he could be a 20 and 15 guy every night. Rudy Gobert could go 20 points, 15 rebounds every single night if you fed him the ball like when he was with the Jazz. Well, now you have Anthony Edwards and Carl Anthony Towns who so has to play his role. Um, but but Anthony Edwards not showing up is not, not an alarm for me at all. It, it's, it's actually kind of a bat signal to say who else is going to step up. And, and we found out like they do have – other pieces, Mike Conley picked up the slack, Kyle Anderson, Nas Reed. And so when you're thinking about that whole bench, you know, we're saying like, what, eight to nine players are going to play. It's kind of cool to see Anthony Edwards kind of be cooled off a little bit with foul trouble, not playing as much, but 
have the rest of the team pick it up. There was no woe is me, uh, you know, forcing shots up. That's where bad teams uh, lose games when they start forcing shots up when they're not hot. And this is not what you're seeing from the Timberwolves. Yeah, it couldn't have worked out better, really, Reggie, for the Wolves to to be able to play Conley only 31, Ant 26. They win a stress-free game against a quality Eastern team on the road. And this is, like Ron said, this is a bat signal game for Ant Edwards against the East's best, a team that hasn't lost at home in the Celtics. These are the games where Ant shows up. Yeah, and that's why I think that tonight is going to be a fun matchup for him because it seems like whenever the competition is is higher, whenever you know you expect him to to rise to the occasion, he does because it's like he's a he's a gamer, man. He like lives for for moments like that. If if Tatum and Brown are are trying to go off and, and do their thing, he's like, that's all right. I'm gonna come back down. Heat check you. You know, sometimes. You know, he gets himself in trouble with some of these like ill advised uh, shots. But I think, you know, especially with what he had go on last night, I, I could see him coming out aggressive and getting some points and leading the, the Wolves in points in that first quarter. So I think he probably reverses course tonight. And this is a really good test against a really good opponent tonight, despite, you know, who may play, who may not play. And I, I just think this is the Wolves chance to to kind of get a little bit more of that that national attention. Nobody is talking about him. I have NBA today on in the background, like every day as I'm like getting ready for work and nobody is talking about the Timberwolves. And so, you know, not that that, that's important, but this is a a way to, to kind of wake people up. Like, Hey, like, uh, yeah, uh, this team sits at the top of the, the West. Like, can you maybe pay attention a little bit? I know the Clippers are surging. I know it's popular to talk about the Lakers all the time. Denver's the the defending champion, so you have to talk about them. But, you know, what the Wolves are doing this season is impressive, and I don't know that anybody necessarily was expecting this level of them just leading the West like this um, for as long as they've had, as long as they have. So I'm, I'm interested to see how they, how they play tonight, and I think Ant has a, a nice bounce-back game. Yeah, uh, Ben Beacon, let's toss it to you. Your thoughts on the Magic win last night. Yeah, I think what was most impressive is it was it was dominant from the start. I mean, they were up 11-0. Magic, the Magic didn't score until the 8-50 mark in the first quarter. And uh, it's, I mean, the Magic obviously shorthanded, missing some rotation guys, uh, and, and specifically um, uh, Franz Wagner. But, um, I mean, they had a great plan against Paolo Bancaro defensively. And offensively, the Wolves did what they couldn't do against Dallas early in the week, which was punish mismatches, punish a shorthanded, much smaller team. Uh, The Magic were also missing Wendell Carter Jr. They just were missing some front court guys. And they were also switching a bunch of things. They tried some zone. And Rudy and Kat did a really good job of getting into the paint um, and punishing mismatches, which the Wolves do not consistently do. And it sounds a lot easier than it actually is in practice against good defensive teams, which Orlando is a good defensive team, which was the other thing. Even though they were shorthanded, like it's a well-coached, strong defense and uh the wolves had their way with them throughout the game and on the other side of the floor they held orlando to 36.2 percent shooting they held them to 92 points for the game and for a little while until late in the third quarter when the wolves started turning the ball over you know a lot more frequently and the magic got a few easy buckets it looked like they were going to hold them to you know 85 or less like like i started looking up you know what are the least points scored in a game over the past couple i mean the the magic had like what like 40 points at halftime or something like that so this was seven Yeah. Yeah. 37. Yeah. So um, this was a a complete dominant performance for Minnesota. It easily could have been a a bigger win. Um, And actually, it was more to me that the Magic getting back within 20 ish points was really more about them actually playing hard to the finish. I was impressed with the fight that Orlando showed. I don't think Minnesota necessarily let the foot off the gas at all. I just think Orlando decided to start playing hard toward the end of the game, which was you know impressive if you're a fan of the Magic. Um, But overall, this was just a a strong performance. and hopefully the Wolves got, you know, with Anton a little bit of foul trouble and, and you know, a, a few less minutes here and there for the starters. When it was all said and done, hopefully they can uh, all, ba- all be able to play in Boston on Wednesday night and play their regular minutes. Jack. Yeah, I was really impressed with, with pretty much everything that, that Ben laid out there in terms of what we saw from the Timberwolves defense last night. But um, specifically, I think my biggest thing was was the way Carl Anthony Towns got it going early uh, was the most important thing to me from this game, mostly because of the way that he did it. Um, so Carl Anthony Towns hasn't really played in the corner a whole lot this season, um, just because I, I think Chris Finch and Carl and Anthony Towns both would probably agree that he's a lot more than just a guy that 
you know, you can put in a corner. Um, but with how good of a shooter he is and how much, frankly, he can get in the way of some of the other things that are going on the floor, like Mike Conley and Rudy Gobert pick and roll or Ant and Rudy pick and roll, um, you know, or some of the, the kind of handoff stuff that we see atop the key. Putting him in the corner just gives the Timberwolves offense so much more space to operate at times. And so I was pleased that he was in the corner, um, you know, to kind of start the game with the starters a little bit and, and made a couple of three point shots, started two of two. And then, um, you know, really used that to get his pump and drive or pump and go game going where he, you know, pump fake a three on the perimeter and then start driving to the rim and then open things up for him. Um, you know, had that huge poster dunk on Mo Wagner, which was huge. Um, and then from there, he just defers, diversified, you know, his scoring game really well from shooting threes to, um, you know, taking a dribble or two inside the arc and shooting from there. I uh, had a couple of really nice left box post ups on Gogo Patadze. Um, and so I think the more that he can kind of diversify what he's doing, um, but have that all be rooted in three point shooting and starting the game off as a three point shooter, um, I, I think was really important. I mean, he scored 28 points on 11 of 19 shooting. Uh, it was five of five from deep. Uh, I had five assists, three of them to Rudy Gobert. Uh, he's now tied with Mike Conley for most assists to Rudy Gobert the, of any Timberwolves player this season, I believe, with 36. Um, and, and had more steals than, than turnovers. Uh, had three steals and two turnovers. So pretty complete game for Carl. Um, and, and I certainly think one that um, the Timberwolves are going to need him to replicate um, moving forward, especially, you know, down the stretch of their season where Anthony Edwards is going to see two guys uh, defending him uh, at the point of attack uh, above the break on screens. And so the more the Ant can kind of use the pass to get past that front line of defense, I think the more it's going to open up the backside of the defense and provide some some really wide open shots for Carl, whether he wants to take those threes or or drive it to the rim and, you know, and, and, and dunk on anyone that, that has a late close out to him. So, uh, great blueprint game for Carl and hopefully something we, we see continue as, as early as tonight. Yeah. The Carl Anthony towns low kind of coincided with the wolves low, but you get him going again, makes this team look a whole lot more dangerous. Also quick plug. You can hear Jack Borman reacting to tonight's game and every game with Luke Inman on the locked on wolves postcast. Catch that here on locked on sports, Minnesota. Uh, let's toss it to Ben beacon. I want to ask about this schedule gauntlet. Wolves are 15 of 16 games into this stretch where they play nothing but playoff teams. They're nine and six. They've lost some games against some, some healthy powerhouse clubs. Um, and we've had some questions about them, but ultimately nine and six, that's a 600 winning percentage against playoff teams with one game to go. The cherry on top game, maybe the best in the NBA tonight against the Celtics to close out this gauntlet. But how do you feel about the Wolves now uh, versus before this stretch began? I would say slightly better. I mean, I think, um, I, you know, I, all along, I just kind of, fig you, you figure you're playing 16 playoff, playoff teams, right? I think 11 of, no, 11 of them are on the road. They played two back-to-backs, uh, you know, uh, uh, over this course. All of them are above 500 teams. They're all likely playoff teams, almost certainly playoff teams, and only a couple will probably even fall into the play -in. Like, these are all legitimately good teams. And I mean, if you have a, a, a above 500 winning percentage against those teams, that's a positive thing. Um, I think the most impressive thing about it is they never lost more than two games in a row. No matter what happens in Boston, like they for the first time this year, they lost two in a row the first week of January. But to play this many good teams in a row and not lose three or more in a row, I talked about this on Lockdown Wolves the other day. Like you go back and look at, you know, at, and at, I'm sure at some point in the second half of the season, they'll have a three game losing streak because it's a long season. But like, remember Denver last March, they lost like, four games in a row twice they had like six out of nine losses or something like that in March and everyone thought the sky was falling for the nuggets and they end up winning the title like teams have these stretches during the course of the season and go back and look at some of those like I I did this I went back and looked at the last five seasons and looked at like the winning percentages of you know the top seeds and the wolves are still above where usually the one seed lands um you know usually one of the two one seeds has a worse winning percentage where the than the where the wolves sit right now and they've already done the toughest stretch in their schedule um, go back and look at the Denver stretches last year. They lost to some bad teams in there because that happens in the NBA. So we can expect the Wolves to have some more bumps in the road, but the fact that they're going to come out of this thing either 10 and six or nine and seven against legit, really difficult competition um, is really impressive. And, and and it's a testament, obviously, to the players to, you know, um, to, to keep the foot on the gas, but also to the coaching staff to make sure these guys are prepped and also that things haven't spiraled. And And honestly, like, that magic game last night, it it I don't want to be too, you know, 
over dramatic about this, but if they end up losing that game or like barely winning against the shorthanded Orlando team on the front end of a back to back in Boston, and then you lose in Boston, and now you're talking about three straight losses and five out of six losses, like this whole stretch feels very different. And so I think the result in Orlando and, and the way that the Wolves went about winning that game was super important. And it makes us, it makes me look at this whole stretch where they're nine and six a lot differently. And now, obviously, you got to, you got, you know, I say you got to finish, we're not even halfway through the schedule, but the rest of this month looks really soft, except for like an OKC game in there. There's a couple, you know, Clippers, but I mean, they haven't played Portland yet. They haven't played Detroit yet. Uh, they haven't played Washington yet. You got all those guys in the schedule. You get Charlotte again, you get Brooklyn, you get San Antonio again. Um, this is a real opportunity for Minnesota to give themselves a little bit of separation in the West. If you can beat the thunder in there and, and hold the tiebreaker over them. Um, it's, it's really impressive that they've gone nine and six over the stretch. And, and I, I don't know that, you know, I, I saw recently Michael Malone was complaining about Denver's back-to-backs and the wolves not playing back-to-backs and uh, OKC not playing back-to-backs. And it's like, I don't think they've played 16 straight playoff teams. Like this hasn't exactly been an easy stretch for Minnesota uh, with 11 of 16 on the road as well. Yeah, I mean, and the Wolves are also a three-minute meltdown against Dallas from being perfect on this road trip, too. I mean, they they played a game against Dallas that could have been uh, victorious. But, Jack, I want to I wanna pick your brain on the six losses in that subset. So we're obviously, we're very pleased with the winning percentage. We're pleased with the 9-6 and six record. But in those losses, I guess, have you learned about where the Wolves might be vulnerable or the teams that have beaten them, how they've beaten them. What have we taken away from sort of the difficulties? Yeah, absolutely. But first, uh, Michael Malone, the Timberwolves, Thunder, and Nuggets, I'll play 12 back-to-backs this season. So it's coming for the Timberwolves and Thunder. Um, but but as it relates to the defense, yeah. Um, the Timberwolves, I, I think a, a main theme has kind of, you know, occurred in some of these losses is that obviously, um, you know, when you look at uh, the two losses to New Orleans, a loss to the Knicks, a loss to – um, you know, Dallas, all these teams have really impressive star players. Um, when you think about Zion Williamson, Jalen Brunson, uh, Luka Doncic and Kyrie Irving, both went bananas. But for me, it's more about the other end of the floor um, defensively uh, for these other teams going against the Wolves offense. All these teams are able to switch one through five and can play zone defense really effectively. And, and that's uh, you know, kind of produced more isolation basketball from the Timberwolves offense. Uh, and frankly, outside of Anthony Edwards, uh, maybe Nas Reed. There aren't a whole lot of guys that that you really want playing isolation ball, um, especially off the bench. I think we've seen a lot of that from from guys like Kyle Anderson um, and Kill Alexander Walker at times, which has been problematic. Um, and, and overall, it just results in less ball movement from the Timberwolves offense, um, which which to me equals a, a less effective bench and a less effective Rudy Gobert, um, just because Gobert is obviously a guy that needs other people to help get him involved. Um, and so I think the the biggest thing for the Timberwolves is going to be a you know coming up with a solution for how they can you know navigate playing offense against teams that are really long, um, can switch, can make life difficult for them, uh, and can play a lot of different styles of defense. I think it's pretty rare uh, in the NBA that that you're able to play you know two, three, four, five different you know s- styles of defense pretty effectively. Um, but the Pelicans, Knicks, uh, uh, Mavericks, and and even the Sixers are all capable of doing that. Um, and, and so I think that's why those losses, I think, uh, came the way they did. I think New Orleans, especially is a team that I would circle as, you know, one a or one B in terms of toughest playoff matchups for the wolves, along with the Clippers, which we'll see, I think on, on Saturday night here. So, yeah. um, so that's something to keep an eye on. I, you know, I had this Orlando, and I said this with Luke on the, on the postcast after the Dallas game is that, you know, Dallas switches a ton. They can go small. Orlando switches a ton, can go small. Boston can do that. Uh, and the Clippers, so the Timberwolves that have some opportunities here to try to right the ship and and put some good things on film that they can refer back to in the playoffs against that, you know, switching or zone defense. Um, and it was just unfortunate that the Magic had so many guys down um, and weren't really able to to play their schemes all that well. But but the Timberwolves did play really well against the the Magic zone last night. Like like Ben mentioned, did a good job of uh, getting the ball inside and. Uh, and dunking on some smaller guards that ended up having to check Rudy and Carl. So that's obviously a plus and and something that that we'll see tonight against Boston. If if Drew Holiday plays, they like to put him at the at the bottom at the, in the center spot of a two three zone. And then once the ball gets to the middle of the floor, switch to a man defense, kind of all at once. It's it's incredible to watch. You know, one of the coolest defensive concepts I think I've seen all season from any NBA team. Um, but he's questionable uh, with with an elbow sprain. So we'll see if if he's able to go, but. 
um, yeah, switching and in and, and, uh, and zone defenses have, have troubled the Wolves and, and hopefully they can, you know, find some some sustainable solutions that they can take with them into the second half of the season and, and hopefully the playoffs. Kind of broke it down in seven game series. And so if you think about the first six, they would have won those. And you take the Grizzlies, you can take the Grizzlies out of there because that 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 was no John Morant. So I'm not going to count that one. So if you start there, they went four and two in that first six game stretch. So they won that seven game series with those teams. You look at the next stretch, got a little, got a hairy. They were three and three, and then they won. They went, they won that another one. They went four and three in that seven game stretch. And now they're one and one, and they're headed to play the Celtics. Even if they lose to the Celtics being one and two, same down the stretch. And what that means is if you look at a playoff team, that's where a lot of people question some of these playoff teams is can they, what can they do in a seven game series? Like, can they hold on and close teams out? Can they not panic and get these wins? And I, and I think Ben brought this up that they haven't lost two, you know, more than two games in a row. And I think that's key. Like that mindset going through, if they finish, uh, I think, you know, I think we were all saying like 52 wins or less than that, you know, 55 wins, maybe, you know, a bold bet was I think 56 wins. This team, I mean, this is a team that could potentially at this moment win 60 games. And if they were to go 58 to 60 games, again, going into it, playing against whoever makes in the play in could be the Lakers, could be who, you know, the, the, the NBA might try to rig it. But when you think about how they're going to do it, it's winning these seven game stretches and, and they're doing it like and they're getting it from different people. It's not always Anthony Edwards. Like we just saw this last game before that. We know Nas Reed has stepped up before that. We know Jaden McDaniels has stepped up. Uh, you know, it, it's been different guys stepping up whenever one of their three bigs does not make a play. And so to be in this stretch, I mean, if you add the Grizzlies, they're 10 and six. They're 10 and six in, 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 in that stretch with the Grizzlies in there. I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty you know, I'm good with that. I'm good with that stretch of being 10 and 6. Reg, put a bow on this conversation. The gauntlet ends tonight. Yeah, I I think um, if you're a Wolves fan, you're encouraged, especially because, you know, they do sit at the top of the West still um, with all these games that they've played against some of these, you know, top upper tier opponents. Um, I think that is a very encouraging thing. And look, the NBA season is long, so you don't expect them to just win every game or bulldoze everybody. I think Ben said earlier, I mean, it's the it's the NBA. Like sometimes even the best teams, like the Nuggets last year, they lost to some bad teams. And so, you know, it, it happens just because like it's just kind of hard to just get up for every game every night. You know, you, you want to bring it, but, you know, sometimes the shots just don't fall and, you know, Cat's been – He's been victim of, of the slump at times. And so, you know, it was encouraging to see him play as well as he played last night. You just you hope for a little bit more consistency uh, from him in that regard because of how talented of a player he is. And so I think there are a lot of different things that are encouraging, you know, continuing to figure out the rotations and playing through some of the slumps that they've had offensively. Those are things that encourage you uh, moving forward through the rest of the season that they'll continue to do what they need to do to, to get a good position in the playoffs and, and surge, um, and hopefully make it out of that first round this time. You know, it's, it's been a long time coming. Um, but this, this team looks, looks well equipped to, to do some, some special things and, and hang in there with some of the best in the league. Less than a month to the trade deadline. Do our guys have any suggestions for that? And we'll look at Ricky Rubio's legacy as a Timberwolf as he announced his retirement. That's all coming up on the Minnesota Basketball Party. And our show is brought to you by FanDuel. The NFL regular season wrapped, but there's still time to get in the action with the playoffs beginning. You can get in the fun at FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That $5 bet could come on your Timberwolves. They're plus 290 tonight at Boston. Bet five, win like 15. That's not bad. And then you get 150 on top of that. So then you got some money to toss around the NFL playoffs. You got college basketball. Uh, you got futures bets. So many options at FanDuel. They are indeed America's number one sports book. The parlays are particularly fun. Same game parlays. You can build your parlay in the Parley Hub and find suggestions in the Explore tab. Uh, that's a great feature at FanDuel or FanDuel.com slash locked on. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make your first bet a layup. FanDuel, an official partner of the NFL. 
All right, welcome back, Minnesota Basketball Party. Make sure you hear us on the Locked on Wolves audio feed as well as Ben Beacon's daily shows there where he's covering the Wolves for a half an hour, five days a week. Check out the postcast with Luke Inman, Jack Borman, and uh, find us potentially streaming on the 24-7 YouTube live stream here at Locked on Sports Minnesota. Please subscribe. All right, guys, trade deadline less than a month away. It is February 8th. I believe. Let's start with Reggie Wilson. Do you have one suggestion for the Wolves? Could be just a position you want to address, a concern. Are you okay with this team standing pat? What do you think? I think if anything, maybe I would maybe suggest a minor upgrade at at point guard um, behind Conley. But honestly, I think the best part about this Wolves team is the depth, and I've said it on this show several times. And so, you know, maybe maybe you do that, but maybe you just continue to stick with with guys like Shake and and Naw, and just continue to just you know make it work. But I think one of the biggest things is is they are figuring out these rotations, and they are you know relatively healthy. J Mac is back, and so I think those are those are some things that that kind of Make me say a little bit more on the side of, uh, I don't think they necessarily need to make a move. I think as long as they can be healthy with the depth that they have, I think they could they could be fine with, with the guys that they have. Yeah, Ben, let me toss it to you, and let me also ask this question. So the Wolves obviously don't have a lot of money to throw around, so they can't really acquire someone like Zach Levine unless they're trading a big salary to to get them. Uh, do you think if the Wolves acquired, does that mean they? you think they need to ship someone like Kyle Anderson off uh, to make the money work there? Like, how do you think a trade would work? Yeah, I mean, Kyle Anderson is really the only expiring contract that that it's it's really he's the only trade ship that makes sense from. Obviously, you're not trading, you know, at this stage, no matter what anyone says, you're not trading Carl Anthony Towns right now. Mm -hmm. You're right. not trading. And obviously, you're not trading Jade McDaniels. You're not trading Rudy. So Kyle Anderson's the like in that sweet spot where he holds value. He's a rotation player, no matter what team he's on. And he has a relatively large expiring contract. So he's still, a, he is a tradable asset. If the wolves do make a move, it's going to have to be slow-mo and, you know, maybe something else going out. Um, but as you said, they can't take on a whole lot of future salary because of their, their cap situation anyway. Um, so I, I, you're right. He's the piece that would have to move. I think it's unlikely. Um, this kind of feels like, hey, you're first in the West. Why would you move one of your top? You know, I know Slomo hasn't played as well this year as he did last year, but you know, why move a top seven, eight rotation guy, top seven rotation guy, um, and rock the boat for what could potentially be a minor upgrade? Um, I know it's popular to talk about the Wolves needed shooting. I'm, I mean, sure, it'd be nice to have more shooting. You could always use more shooting, but they're fifth in the league in three point percentage. It's just the volume needs to increase. They need to shoot more threes in general, and that that's going to make a big difference. And, and of course, the reason why they're so they're high volume guys are also the guys that make a lot of threes, right? Towns and Ants specifically shoot a lot of threes and they make a lot of threes. That helps your overall percentage. Some of the guys that are lower volume, like Alexander Walker and, and McDaniels, you know, he was around 38 percent, but he had that 0 for 5 from three in Dallas the other night that dropped him down a little bit. If those guys could be more in the 37, 38, 39 percent range, that's a big difference than 35 percent. Um, and, and there's reason to believe they can do that. So I, I don't know that this team, my, my advice would be, you know, at some point play shake built a little bit more, see if he's a viable option to give you another ball handler somebody that can give you some offense. You can turn to in a series and be like, Hey man, our offense isn't moving. Like go score some buckets, right? Be that six man type off the bench. You have to figure out whether or not that's viable. I, I, I hear the point about having a backup point guard. I just would be surprised because if you acquire somebody like Tyus Jones, another name that's come up a bunch, um, and it'd be great to have Tyus Jones on the team. He's awesome. He's he would be the best backup point guard in the league. But are you going to have the minutes for Tyus Jones? And does his profile? I think I think he's in some ways a super version of Jordan McLaughlin, right? So he would take on that role, but he needs to play more than 12, 14 minutes a game. And then you're pulling minutes from one of your rangier defenders like Nikhil Alexander Walker. And so, you know, it's it's not a zero sum game here like there or it is a zero sum game really like there's only so many minutes to go around so i'd be surprised if they made a move um i mean any shooting you bring in would also have to provide you with something else i think they're better off having a well-rounded team player like a kyle anderson than i mean they had a guy who's a 40 percent three-point shooter in theory and matt ryan and let him walk because like there's other stuff that matters too 
And given where they are at first in the West, if they were fifth in the West, you know, maybe they, they, they try and make a move, but I'd be surprised if they did something, especially something significant heading into the deadline. Um, I don't want to skip over Jack. We'll get right back to Jack, but I think Ron, did you circle Tyus? Were you on the Tyus Jones bandwagon to bring him in? I was, I was, I, I, only reason I say that, I mean, it's, it's a pipe dream, but I'm looking at if they were to go to his agent, uh, you know, if they trade for him, then talk to him about, Hey, if we trade for you, we can't, we can't afford your contract. So here's what we can do and offer him like, here's what a future contract would look like or a trade and resign and say, let's put him on a long-term deal because we know Mike Conley, we need a succession plan for him. Maybe Tyus Jones looks at, you know, what's the value of being on certain teams and making more money and being unhappy like Jordan Poole or being with a team like the Timberwolves, Anthony Edwards, him, uh, Rudy Gobert and Carl D. Towns for another two or three years where they have a chance to compete for a championship, maybe two or three years. Tyus is a champion when you think about playing at Duke and he has a champion mindset when you think about playing at Apple Valley High School in Minnesota. Like he's always been a champion. And so you give him those pieces. He's back home. You can sell. Even, I mean, they're already selling, but you can sell even more of a dream to Minnesotans of like, hey, we brought, you know, hometown favorite Tyus Jones back. You know, when you look at turnover to minutes, he's one of the, the most efficient guards in the NBA. I, I just feel like and he, he never takes a bad shot, it feels like. Like he he's a true, he's a consummate team player where he's willing to feed Anthony Edwards, willing to feed Carl Anthony Towns. And that's the one reason why I say I, I would I would love to see Tyus Jones come back to Minnesota. Yeah, I I'll, I'll hot take, hot take alert. Look out. I would be more fired up about Tyus Jones returning to the Wolves than I was for Ricky Rubio. Oh, gasp, gasp. I I would love it. Um, Jack, what do you think? Wet blanket, 0% chance that happens, but I support you guys in dreaming. Um, and, and I love Tyus Jones. You know, I've known Tyus Jones, or I've been around him since like I was a freshman in high school, sophomore in high school. He's an awesome dude. Um, love him. Got a great family would love him back here where there's just a zero percent chance that happens. Um, they can't afford it beyond the season either, but um, yeah, I think the the thing you got to suss out at the trade deadline is there's kind of two different pools that you're dipping your toes into. It's the trade market pool. And then there's the buyout pool, which is uh, something the Timberwolves are certainly going to be a factor in this season, considering that they have one of the most well-liked executives in the league in Tim Connolly. Uh, they have a number one player that I'm sure there is a long list of players who would like to play with in Anthony Edwards um and a team that has a legitimate shot at, at contending in a, in a wide open western conference i'm not going to say they have the best chance but uh certainly one of the the three or four teams in the short list and so um that's a factor and uh i'd actually push back a little bit against what what ben said and that kyle anderson is your only trade chip that you have you have shake milton has five dollars five million dollars and pretty much expiring expi expiring money um, and they have Wendell Moore Jr. and Josh Minot, who at this point, if they're not playing, they're probably not going to ever play for the Timberwolves. Um, and so I think the Wolves would be more than uh, OK with including those guys in a trade to uh, to make the salary match um, and a deal for for a guy that's making, you know, 10 million dollars or less could get you there. And they also have five uh, second round picks that they can play with. Uh, one of those include is going to be the the less favorable of the Washington or Memphis second round pick this coming draft, um, which is undoubtedly going to be one of the first seven or eight uh, picks of that second of that second round, which will be a pretty valuable piece. And so um, you think about guys like Steve Bay, who they had noted interest in at the trade deadline last year and almost made a move for uh, as a four million four point six million dollar contract this year uh, as a restricted free agent after the season. Uh, I know Monte Morris hasn't played at all this year because of a quad injury in Detroit, but uh, if he's a guy that Tim Connolly loved in Denver. Um, and then that's a guy you might have to move Anderson for potentially. Uh, and then another one in Alec Burks uh, with the Pistons as well as a 38% career three point shooter that can provide some of that scoring off the bench that you were talking about uh, Ben, with, uh, with what shake potentially could do, but and um, then buyout guys, I think that's where they might address the shooting need. Um, just because I think there's going to be more shooters available on the buyout, whether you on the buyout market, whether you look at you know Doug McDermott, who uh, you know plays for the Spurs but doesn't really fit their timeline at all, considering he's getting up there in age, and then Joe Harris as well as a 44% career three point shooter, um, who is pretty much out of the rotation at this point for the Pistons, and I'm sure would be willing to cough up some of that 17 million dollar salary um, <laughs> to to be bought out and, and go play somewhere else, um, and he's got plenty of playoff experience between the, the Cavaliers and the Nets as well. So those are all guys that I'd, I'd keep an eye on, but, but I think that 
I, I, I agree that I would be really surprised if they moved Kyle Anderson, but I would be shocked if they did not make uh, a trade. And I would also be shocked if they did not also acquire a player in the buyout market. Uh, that's a great take. Um, good stuff, guys, on that. I'm about to get real unsentimental about Ricky Rubio coming up next on the basketball party. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. Uh, around New Year's, we like to make resolutions. We like to change things in our lives. Sometimes we maybe overlook the stuff that we're doing well or the stuff that we just need to, to get a little more organized or just tweak kind of within ourselves. Uh, therapy helps you find your strengths, helps empower you so you can ditch the extreme resolutions and make those small incremental changes that really stick. Uh, so if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. Totally online, convenient, flexible, suited to your schedule. Uh, I've done it. It's important. It's valuable. Uh, and it really helps. So just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist. Switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Celebrate the progress you've already made. Visit betterhelp.com slash locked on NBA today. Get 10% off your first month. BetterHelp. H-E-L-P. Betterhelp.com slash locked on NBA. All right, guys, Ricky Rubio announces his retirement. Uh, obviously, longtime beloved Timberwolves point guard. And it sounds like his retirement is is comes in sort of the shadows of of tough mental health struggles for him and a rocky end to his career. He lost a parent a few years ago. So uh, we wish him certainly the best. I for one, am am a little surprised, I guess, at the sentimentality around Ricky Rubio, um, a player that people kind of revere as if he was Pete Maravich a little bit. Um, but ultimately, he didn't really oversee any success in Minnesota as their point guard. In fact, I thought somewhat of an underwhelming career. Um, and some people have alluded to like retiring his number and and we're all Rubio fans, right? I guess I would just pump the brakes on legacy talk around Rubio. Maybe it's because the Wolves don't have a lot of legacy players, so he stands out. He's second all time in assists behind Kevin Garnett. But what what do you make of Rubio's lasting legacy as a Wolf? Yeah, I think that you know part of the reason why I think Ricky Rubio Sam might hold that kind of weight with some people uh, is because that Ricky Rubio really I think kind of made basketball fun again and gave this fan base some sort of hope or something to look forward to in the future after, you know, arguably the darkest time in the history of the franchise after trading Kevin Garnett away to Boston. Um, and I think that's part of the reason why fans will always be grateful um, that, that he played for the Timberwolves. Um, and, and I, and I can't really push back against that. Right. I think, you know, sometimes with our teams, we know that they're not going to, do very well or they're going to have a tough season and you just want to really be looking forward to, you know, three or four subplots that you can follow for the entire season. And, um, you know, Spanish phenom who has, you know, this insane passing highlight reel um, and has done really awesome things overseas before coming over to the NBA is kind of this enigma that, that we don't know how his game will necessarily translate to the NBA. Uh, I, I think inspired hope in a lot of people. And I, and I think that that, um, that was great. And then when you think about all the stuff that he did off the basketball court, um, with his foundation and his work, um, specifically regarding, um, you know, cancer research, obviously spoke about his losing his mother to cancer was, was really, really hard on him. Um, so, and, and then too, you think about all the guys, Devin Booker, Donovan Mitchell, Cat, and all these guys, um, just saying glowing things about him as a, as a phenomenal teammate and leader. And I think that, um, you know, maybe when the basketball part is a little bit underwhelming, when you look at it in its totality, I think it's a little easier to, to put a little bit more of a positive spin on that, I guess, when uh, when you're an awesome teammate and, and guys that you played with had nothing but, but glowing things to say about you. That's all fair. Uh, Ron, you have a Rubio take? Uh, for me, Rubio is always going to be synonymous with Steph Curry. Uh, when you think about that draft with Steph Curry and Johnny Flynn, that's the first thing that I look at, not being a Minnesotan, not being completely tied into the Rubio era, uh, the Rubio legacy. Um, I wasn't around for a lot of it. I was gone to the Baltimore Ravens. And so, you know, 
coming back and then hearing about Rubio. The one thing I will say is he has set himself apart from Johnny Flynn, but it's it sucks that his his legacy will always be tied to Johnny Flynn. And people will some people will always hold that as a negative. Like, I wish they would have drafted Steph Curry instead of two uh, guards like that. It could have been a different story, blah, blah. They could have had Rubio and Steph Curry. And maybe it's a totally different aspect of like, man, Rubio would have, you know, 20,000 assists just passing it to Steph Curry in his career. And we'd be talking about a different story, maybe a, a championship with Steph Curry, Kevin Garnett, R Ricky Rubio. Um, there, there's a lot that you can always say the what ifs within Rubio, but the one thing I will say, as far as an international player, he, he lived up to what, you know, you're getting a lot of these international players, which is just a person that loves the sport of basketball, a person that's always going to be there, uh, and wants to be there every night. A person does, that doesn't think business first is always like basketball first. I think that's what always stood out to me about Rubio is he was, it seemed like he was always a basketball first type of guy, um, and truly lived up to that international level of play, which is just, uh, very, um, I want to say goal oriented and very uh, like his fundamentals were always like he always was good with the ball. And, and again, I know there's tons of like negative right now going on with American basketball because of AAU and how the practice schedule works versus games. Uh, but Rubio really stood up to that level of like, man, this, this guy is a really good player. It's worth looking at other international players because there are some players that come over from certain countries and then you get a bad taste in your mouth about that country. Like, ah, their basketball not it might not be as good as we see, but Rubio stood up to the uh, to the test. Yeah, and, and Reggie, you're another another person that came in after the bulk of the Rubio era. He did have the brief one year return, which I think was also slightly before you arrived. So, kind of as an outsider, Reggie, you come in. What's your take on Rubio? You know, uh, I think I probably should sit this one out just because, like, I wasn't here and I'm not I'm not very privy to the, the Rubio times. I I think um, being here, I have kind of seen that so many people have an affinity for him. But honestly, when just from like the outside looking in back before I even even thought about Minnesota um, and coming here, I didn't really think too much of him because I, I just, you know, um, not necessarily like the greatest shooter you know he had a lot of playmaking skills but like it, he wasn't a guy that i just was like oh yeah like that's a guy that i enjoy watching that's a guy that i really want to tune in to see it just didn't really didn't really strike me so i, I do understand that, that people have quite the affinity for him here in minnesota but i don't really know it i don't know it yeah, no, I, I I get it. You don't want to rile up the masses like I did being kind of mean to him. And I even feel a little guilty about it because I know how beloved he is and a great guy, a great personality. He was fun. Uh, ben Beacon. Yeah, I, I mean, I think Jack and Ron both both uh, said some really good things about about uh, Ricky and, and I guess his um, the way that people feel about Ricky and why they feel the way that they do. It is it is funny I, to what Jack said, like he represented hope at the time and it's still he. Also, like, even though the Wolves never made the playoffs with Ricky Rubio on the roster, which is which is, I guess, not surprising, given how how, how few and far between playoff appearances have been in the post KG era. Um, he if you think about it, he did end up serving as a bridge to the Carl Anthony Towns era. And I know that Cat, you know, is that's a whole other conversation that Cats only made the playoffs with Jimmy Butler and with Anthony Edwards. And there were, you know, four or five years in between that they didn't make the playoffs. But still, that's that's a bridge for that era. He returned in Ant's rookie season. Um, and obviously there was that, that, uh, the, the aunt Ricky relationship that, that Jack mentioned that was really special. Um, so I think it's a combination of what he represented coming out of those dark, you know, the 2005 to 2009 years, um, that were really, really like, first it was, was Al Jefferson going to save the team? Then it was, is Kevin Love going to save the team? And then Ricky was, it was, it was the, um, the excitement of the unknown, right? Because we saw those highlight videos. We knew what he could be. And then he ended up being a really solid NBA point guard. And then the volume, the the longevity of him as a Timberwolf, you mentioned second in assists. He's eighth in games played all time for Wolves players. He's seventh all time in minutes played. So the combination of what he represented, the longevity of him being in Minnesota, the joy that he played the game. And then also, um, there's also this element that I, I remember really well when he came over. And even though the Wolves drafted Ricky Rubio, there was like an 18 month discourse of like, is he even going to come over? Like, does he want to play in Minnesota before the draft? Everyone was like, oh, he doesn't want to play in Memphis, in Minnesota and OKC. He almost played big markets. And so 
even though the Wolves drafted him, there was this element of he still kind of chose to come here. And Minnesotans are territorial and, and people love when other people love their city. Right. And so there was also that piece of it, too. And then and then combined with all those other things, the bridge to towns. I mean, he's certainly, you know, retiring his numbers. That's I wouldn't even advocate for that. I'm obviously I'm a huge Rubio fan as as uh, I have the jersey on the shelf. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, but he's a top 10 wolf of all time. And you could put him somewhere in that category of Sam Mitchell, Wally Zerbiak, Terrell Brandon, right? Like a tier below all those superstars, you know, uh, KG and well, KG's in his own tier, but then Cat and Love and wherever you want to put Jimmy Butler. Um, but he's in that next group of guys. Like you have to talk about him as one of the most important all time Timberwolves, uh, which I know says a lot about the Wolves franchise history. But Ricky really meant something to a huge generation of Wolves fans. I think. This is why I'm bitter. I think that I was sold a bill of goods about the 2013-14 team, which is probably one of the biggest tease Wolves teams of all time. They had Rubio, Love, Derek Williams, Kevin Martin, uh, Gorgie Jang, Chase Buttinger, Corey Brewer, J.J. Barea. Like, they didn't have a lot of high-end talent, but they had a bench, and they were number three in offense that year. If you remember, they blew a lot of teams out, but they lost every close game because they had no, like, half-court game. And I'm still bitter about it. I think we, this is why I I just can't get on board with Rubio because that do, team scarred me. Yeah, we could do a whole show on that team. I mean, that team was that was the Rick Adelman team that had like a point differential of a team that was like a 47 win, 48 win team. And they still won 40 <laughs> games and just missed the playoffs. Like you play that season again and they're a playoff team. Now they're still probably like a six or seven seed, but that was a fun team. Yeah, yeah. 40 and 42, big tease. Uh, all right, in closing, we got about 30 seconds each. Celtics game tonight. Make one bold prediction for Wolves Celtics. Ron Johnson. Uh, Wolves Celtics, I'm going to say Jason Tatum goes off and Anthony Edwards goes off. We're going to get a show. That's my prediction. I'm going to say the Timberwolves win uh, by probably like four points. I'm here for it. Reggie. Yeah, I don't know that I promise a Timberwolves win. I mean, I would like to see it, you know, just for all the things that I mentioned earlier in the show. But I think I'll go – give me a 40 ball from Ant. Woo! Beacon. That was that. That was literally mine was Ant was going to have a 40-point game. <laughs> I'm going to go Wolves win a close game, and Ant goes for 45-plus. Wolves win a close game. Just keep one-upping it, Jack. Go yeah. 50. No, my, bullet, my, my bullet point was Ant goes for 40. Um, oh, man. You guys are all thinking I'll, this I'll give you another one. Ant, Ant, Cat, and Jaden outscore Tatum, Brown, and White. Uh, Ant and Jade, Ant and Jalen Brown are very close. Both Adidas guys, both from Atlanta. Um, Ant's going to want to get up for it. Um, 65 points for Anthony Edwards. <laughs> Please come true. His fan duel over under is 27 70, and a half. 70. Devin Booker. Do I hear 70 in Boston? De Shout out Devin Booker. Funny you mentioned that. What a nice look at Anthony Edwards. Look at that. Look at that. Ooh, that did is, you buy that it? Is, or did, did no, they send me it? some? They sent me four pair of them. Who is they? I Adidas. need your people. Yeah. Adidas hooked me up. They sent me wow. four pair. While wearing a Nike shirt. Great job. While bro. wearing a go where's the gophers? The gophers refused <laughs> to sign with Adidas. Shout out to Adidas basketball. Appreciate the love. I might have to hoop in those. You got size 13? I appreciate it. They're that. mine. I got my 13s. I got some 10s okay. and 11s and a 6. I got Let's some 13s see. over here, Reg. <laughs> okay. Well, let, let me holler at you, Jack. I, I don't think you need those. All right. Well, if if a little birdie wants to send some uh, my way, too, you know, size 12s. Uh, we, uh, we have Wolves Talk every Wednesday here in the Minnesota Basketball Party, Minnesota Football Party, Mondays and Thursdays, Ron Johnson Show. Uh, on Tuesdays, and he also hosts the roundtable on Fridays. Wolves postcast tonight. Luke Inman, Jack Borman, after Wolves and Celtics. Enjoy the game. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Talk to you next week.